Welcome to the Quantum Biology Collective podcast, where we break down the practical strategies of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. This is your host, Meredith Oak, QBC co-founder and executive coach with a friendly reminder, podcasts are conversations, not consultations. So if you're looking for a practitioner, check out our directory at www.quantumbiologycollective.org. For those of us who understand that regulated circadian rhythms are foundational to health, but have struggled to get our friends and family on board, we've long wished that an authority in the field would write a book explaining it all. Well, that has happened. Dr. Martin moore is a leading expert on circadian clocks and the health problems caused by artificial light at night. As a former professor at Harvard Medical School for over 20 years, he led the team that changed the course of circadian medicine. They located the suprachiasmatic nucleus, proving that there is a biological clock in the human brain. His new book, The Light Doctor, explains exactly how messing with these clocks in our bodies leads to multiple health issues, including sleep disorders, fatigue, diabetes, obesity, and cancer. This is a fascinating conversation with a longtime expert. Enjoy. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we are here today with Dr. Martin Moore Eid, uh, and also a panel of live guests from the QBC Collective. Um, welcome, Martin. It's such a pleasure to have you. And as I said before we started recording, thank you so much for writing this book. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for reading it and, and helping spread the word because. Uh, yeah, the trouble is the people who know this stuff and the science know the science already, and maybe in the lighting industry, you know, all talk to each other. But you know, the rest of the world is pretty unaware of some of this, and it's really important for everybody to understand. Yes, they really are, and it was it was shocking to me. And a, a huge reason why I even do this podcast is I personally suffered from from chronic fatigue, and you know, most people in this community. Uh, have had some personal health challenges and work with people who have chronic illness or cancer or things like that. And I, it, it, when I learned about the importance of circadian rhythms, it was shocking. The biggest shock wasn't how important they were. It actually really made a lot of intuitive sense. The big shock was like, why didn't I know this? <laughs> why didn't anyone tell me not to read an iPad before bed? <laughs> Could you speak to sort of from your point of view how this how this information got swept under the rug, so to speak? Well, the science has been very, very active. Um, uh, now it, it's got a life history to it. I mean, the year I entered medical school, which was back in the nineteen sixties, that's going to date me. Um, there are only three papers published in the world on circadian rhythms and light, right? Right. And that's just been ramping up and ramping up. Now it's over a thousand every year. A large community of scientists, thirty thousand scientists in the last, uh, you know, twenty years have been publishing on this um, big science area, and a lot of exciting Nobel Prize, obviously, for the discovery mm -hmm. of the clockwork mechanism with Jeffrey Hall and Rushback and the others. Um, so it's it's sort of got known in that science sense. But the applications of this to everyday life has just been missing. I mean, it, it's amazing. You know, you can people not realize that, you know, the blue content of light is in the evening is exacerbating, increasing cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Don't they realize that? And how is it that I, if I walk into a hospital and even the breast cancer ward, why are they using blue rich LED lights at night? I mean, this is staggering. Um, and so forth. So, yeah, there's a huge gap, even, even among the medical profession. And the lighting industry's excuse is, well, the customers aren't asking for it. Hmm. So we've got this challenge is there's the supply and a demand, right? Customer demand, but the customers, if they don't know about it, won't demand it. And overall, it's an education issue. So it affects so many areas. They're not just cancer, as you know. It's obesity, diabetes, heart disease all linked to disruption of our fundamental circadian clocks. So it's it's um it's a huge issue. It affects everybody every day. Um it's a very personal issue. Uh it's a public policy issue. And um we're right in the middle of banning every other type of light. We've banned 
now the incandescent light bulbs they went out august one five states already have banned fluorescence the rest are following um so we got only an led solution and 99 point five percent and more of them are blue rich leds that never switch off never change day or night um and that's all you can find in the if you walk into home depot or any of the other stores you know the big box stores all you can find is these blue rich led lights basically and very very minor number of other lights available so yes we got a big education task and part of writing this book was to try to get it out of the science where the scientists all know mm -hmm. this to something yeah. they could give to their neighbor to read, right? Because one of the most famous, yes. quotes, one of my favorite quotes of mine is Jen uh, Deniman's uh, head of the uh, the Good Light group in in Europe, a campaigning group that came out of the industry, but campaigning for Good Light. He says, "Scientists know, but their neighbors don't. You know, they never talk to each other." And Perfect. So we've, got, we've got this wonderful science that is well validated, and it's and the industry tries to say, well, maybe the science isn't fully validated, but it's fully validated. It's got, yeah. you know, it's it's so far, you know, we we're now at forty years of research in this area, right? Yeah. Um, and the knowledge about blue light has been um, here since for twenty years, really understanding it was the blue, and we've got a challenge, uh, and the challenge is. You know, how do we get the word out there so people can make rational decisions? And um, and how do we get the lighting industry, you know, supplying the lights we need for our health? So anyway, it's a big topic, and uh, that's what I'm 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 in campaigning mode right now, as you probably can tell. We got to get this word out. Well, I love it. And I have to say, you found a community of people who will be right there behind you, our podcast audience, and especially um the professional membership of practitioners that we have are all very much on board with this. And it is one of the fundamental things that they first talk to their clients and patients about, because it's usually something that they, that the client or patient is not paying attention to. Right. So we are super excited to have you. And your point about a book that anybody can read is really the key, right? Because to your point, I learned all about this listening to very obtuse <laughs> podcasts and reading scientific papers right. and yeah. having my husband read them to figure out because I don't have a science background. And I thought, you know, there, there needs to be an easier way. There needs to be um, a more straightforward way because most people are, aren't going to do this and they shouldn't right. have to, right? Because the solution is so simple, as you said, it's like yeah. get better yeah. light bulbs, spend more time outside. Um, so let's back up a little and Tell us the story of how you became involved in circadian medicine. So you were a surgeon, you were working around, the, you were working that schedule and you started to notice even as a very young, healthy person, some adverse effects. And where did that take you? Well, that's right. I mean, I came out of medical school and chose a path of surgery, went in as a junior surgical resident and found myself working these 36 hour long shifts. Uh, 12 hours off, back in for 36. Of course, it was all under bright fluorescent lighting at that time. Um, Blue Rich, by the way. Uh, Blue Rich is not just an LED problem. It's a, been a fluorescent problem. Mm -hmm. um, and finding myself in this constant state of brain fog and fatigue, um, making decisions that didn't make sense the next day. I mean, writing prescriptions I couldn't make sense of. Nodding off in the operating room. That wasn't great for one surgical career. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and that got me so intrigued that I said, let me just take a detour out of my surgical career and I'll go down to Harvard, do a PhD in studying what was the cause of all this. And at that point, um, it was a, the what, circadian clocks had not been discovered in the, in the brain of animals. We knew there were circadian rhythms. Um, it's a very new field. I was advised by some very famous people to stay out of it. It was just, you know, this is voodoo science. Stay out of this circadian rhythm business. Uh, I was sufficiently headstrong. I ignored them and went on. And then when I finished my PhD, which was where I was able to figure out the linkages in the body that keep these rhythms all in sync, because the key is when you're jet lagged or when you're working shifts around the clock or or illness is associated with the disruption. And there are multiple clocks in the body, not just one. And all these multiple clocks in many, most of, or not all of the cells of the body can get out of sync with each other. It's like a discordant orchestra. Um, and um, 
and there's a conductor there. But if you screw it up with the, you know, getting the lights and exposure and the work schedules wrong, um, it has a lot of ill health effects. So there I was, um, you know, not feeling uh, at my best, even though I was really keen to make a good impression and surgical career. And I started getting really fascinated by this. And I said, I've got to get to the bottom of this. And as I say, uh, that led on after my PhD to being invited to join the Harvard Medical School faculty. Um, there was really no one um, in the medical school doing research on this at that time, uh, on in the human and, and the uh, mammalian circadian rhythms. And um, I was fortunate to get a really first class group. But one of the great things of being at Harvard, by the way, it's you know, the professors are made to look good because the students are so good, right? <laughs> you know, I, you know, it, it's one of the things you figure out that the, the class, the medical school class, the PhD, the postdocs who go there, you know, who, who get there, you're the very best people. And you get a great of good people with a good problem to solve. And we had just a bonanza because it was a wide, one, one's dream as a scientist, a wide open area of science. You know, nothing much is known and you have a chance to really identify it. So we identified where... Uh, the circadian clock was. The, there was one, in fact, in humans. It had been discovered um, while I was doing my PhD. It had been discovered in rats and hamsters. But mm -hmm. the general knowledge or the general opinion at that time by the leading experts was, well, circadian rhythms, uh, yes, humans have them, but they don't have a clock in the brain like other animals do. And we don't think they're synchronized by light like animals. You know, it's some weird form of or complex form of social interaction you know, and that was the official position of the field. And so wow. we were able to identify where this clock was. We found it. Um, long story short, um, the reason it was missed, you know, there are atlases of the brain where you slice up the brain at intervals and then have a picture of the brain, right? And a whole series of pictures through the brain. That's what neuro neuroanatomical atlas looks like. The aha moment was when one of my postdocs realized, a guy called Ralph Leidig, who's now a professor at the University of Texas, he realized, oh gosh, they only are showing us every 50th slice and throwing away the 49 slices in between. And so we went back into their records and actually looked at every one of the, the 50 slices. And lo and behold, there was the, the SCN, the superchasic nucleus, missed just because it was small. And, you know, uh, and, and it wasn't consistently seen. So, uh, and then as far as light is concerned, we turned out that, you know, uh, if we put people rigorously under light dark schedules where we could control everything in the environment, we created an apartment in New York, collaboration with uh, one of the leaders in neuroendocrine um, work and so forth, Elliot Weitzman and Chuck Sizer, who was uh, uh, at that time a graduate student with me um, in my lab um, and working with me. And what we were able to do is identify that, in fact, light was the key synchronizer. So there we are. We were actually now on the same plane as all other species, which kind of made sense. And from there, um, we we're able to figure out you know, what happened when the rhythms came apart, how they were normally synchronized together. Um, and, uh, and at that time, there were a couple of things we did not know. Um, and this is this is back in the and, – and we were publishing, too. We got – in the course of a few years, we got 75 peer-reviewed publications out and a, and a textbook in the field called The Clocks That Time Us, which was, you know, then used as a textbook in this field for many years. But we, you know, we got this great body of work, but we didn't know some things. Number one, we thought all visible light was going to be useful. You know, it was just light, right, that was doing it. It turns out that it's only a very narrow part of the spectrum. We didn't realize it was just a narrow part of the spectrum. Number two, melatonin wasn't understood at that mm. time, and the role of melatonin, um, and 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 you know, and and we just so some of those things that we didn't know then became apparent since the year two thousand, and and year two thousand is a very interesting year because number one, the discovery of the uh, melanopsin containing cells, blue light detectors in our back of our eyes in the retina um, were discovered. The, the melanoma was a photopigment that was highly sensitive to blue light. Two is that the that it was blue light specifically that was synchronizing circadian rhythms at, at, at the predominant wavelengths. Three is there was a series of papers coming out saying 
that breast cancer rates and other uh, cancer rates were uh, some certain endocrine sensitive cancers were um, 50 percent higher in people who were exposed to light at night or working night shifts than others. So the, all those, so we had the cancer thing come out. Mm. We had the the blue light there come out, and that all came together. And then and by that time, I'd left Harvard. I'd actually started a consulting company called Circadian because I was applying all the knowledge into how do you cope with people who are working shifts around the clock. And so we've got a consulting company called Circadian, which works as offices all over the world now. Um, and around 2007, the World Health Organization came out with this finding that was stunning. Uh, the conclusion was, looking at all the research, including the work I mentioned, it was pretty clear that, that light at night was a carcinogen and that it was related to exposure to light at night and it suppressed melatonin and it precipitated or accelerated cancer. Um, and that report came out with stunning. Now, I was consulting at that time to over half the Fortune 500 on how to manage people with shifts. And they came to me and said, Martin, you, you know, we can't turn out the lights at night. You know, we can't work in the dark. We can't stop running an oil refinery or a manufacturing plant or whatever, or an airline, we can't just shut everything down at midnight and open it up at six in the morning. We have to run all night. What do we do about this? And that's when I took a detour back into the science of it again. I'd left the science for a while to apply it in the consulting. And I said, okay, let's try to figure out this problem. So the first job was to figure out, okay, we need to know exactly which light it is. And, um, we we were there was a, some misleading research that had been done, uh, very good, very high quality research, which had studied people and showed the a, a pretty broad range of violet, blue, and green light was having a was was effective. We said, well, that's pretty difficult because if you take out all um, all that um, blue and violet and green light, take that all out, you end up with a very ghastly orange yellow color. And that's pretty uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. So, but what we spotted was that it was, these were done by classic photobiologists who study the eye in a process of making the person dark adapted first. So they blindfolded all their subjects for two hours, sit them in a dark room blindfolded, and then they did short pulses of light into the eye of different colors. Well, that's a not normal case. It's true first thing in the morning when you awake, but the rest of the day, we're actually fully light adapted like we all are here. And when we're fully light adapted, you know, we said, let's look at that situation. And when we did, we found, lo and behold, a very narrow band of blue light was really responsible, peaking at about 480, very close to 480. It's the color of sky blue, which is kind of interesting. And then we started realizing some other things about sky blue. Oh my gosh, it is the only color that penetrates the ocean depths. And it, it's one of the most remarkable things of nature that if you take a spectrophotometer and you measure, look at the wavelengths, you go down into the ocean, mm -hmm. you know, the sunlight falling on, of course, sunlight has a very full spectrum. It has all the colors of the rainbow in it. Okay. And, but, but the green starts disappearing and the red disappears and then you know, the uh, the violet disappears, and you end up with this about 475 to 480 blue color once you get down below one to two, one to 200 meters. So it's blue down there, right? Because that's mm -hmm. the only light that penetrates. But that's where life began. So when life began, day was blue and night was black. So the fundamental evolutionary adaptation to the rotating life on our planet for primitive life in the oceans was to develop blue receptors and circadian clocks and interestingly melatonin too even single cells have melatonin in them hmm. so there's the apparatus it's uh, goes back to the cambrian period you know half a billion years ago and we've actually still have it today and one of the things that, you know, is interesting is, okay, you say, well, that's all right down in the ocean, but then life crawled out of it and started inhabiting uh, the terrestrial world. Well, what happened then? And um, and if you look at it, this, that's the color of the blue sky. That's the, that's the color that comes through because light is scattered by the Rayleigh effect in the atmosphere. R blue light scat interacts with the molecules up there. 
scatters the light, and that's why the sky is predominantly blue. But it's also, there's an interesting feature, I don't know how much you want to go into, but the blue hour, which is, there's another effect. There's a third law of physics. So we have seawater light absorption. Mm -hmm. We have the Rayleigh scattering effect up in the sky. And then the ozone layer, as the sun is setting below the horizon, it cuts through the ozone area, and ozone is a light filter, and it absorbs all the other colors except for blue. And so the, there is an hour called the blue hour, which is actually probably about 20 minutes in length. It, it precedes dawn. It's an early warning of dawn, a little flash of blue in the sky, another again at dusk. So again, we had many reasons to keep blue as the key signal. So there we are. And in the same time, in the same time period, along come the Nobel, another Nobel Prize winners who won. Sorry, the I just Prize. want to clarify yeah. quickly. Yeah. So, so the blue in the in the context of nature at the appropriate yes. time of day is life giving, but the blue coming out of a light bulb at night or at inappropriate times is harm inducing. Is that correct? Yes, but let's just clarify. Blue is neither good nor bad. It's both. It's mm -hmm. all about the time of day. Yes. So blue light during the day. You are sitting outside there with a beautiful daylight coming in. You're getting bathed in a lot of blue. I am too here. With the windows behind me, right? That is is um, critical to keeping the circadian clock synchronized today. Mm -hmm. As soon as it's dusk, you want to get rid of all the blue. The problem is we've invented electric lights that are rich in blue which is exactly what you don't want to see, which is what's causing disruption. We also tend to live indoors. If we go back 100 years, people spend most of their time, much of their time outdoors. Now we spend more than 90% of our time indoors and often in rather dim conditions. In fact, it's been pointed out that we live a twilight existence. We live in constant twilight. We not, don't have enough blue usually. Um, Many people just indoors and working in indoor cubicles or whatever else are not exposed to enough blue light during the day. Be and, and that's because a lot the, of it at night. The, when we're outside during the day, the lux is much higher. The sun is very bright. But no matter what kind of light we have inside, it's not it's not matching it, what's happening outside. It's not matching. It's way less. Yes. Just uh, talk about the light levels for a moment. The light levels outside are up to a thousand times brighter than they are during the day. And the blue level, you know, and, and the light levels inside are a thousand times brighter than it is out in the night, even in the bright moon, moonlight. So we've got a, th there's a million times change in light intensity in nature. Wow. We compress it all down and we lose that. And it's that, that is what robustly keeps us synchronized, keeps our bodies healthy. It's why people who live in you know rural existences and everything else are in in general healthier for in, in comparison, um, uh, and um, yeah, it, and it's why the indoor world environment is a rather unhealthy one, and especially when we have light that is way too rich in blue for nighttime use. Now, daytime yeah. you want to exaggerate the blue, but not at night. So right. it's an intensity problem. And it's a blue content. But by the way, the two it's really critical to realize it's both together. You've got to control the brightness of the light and the percent of it that's blue. Right. So it's the color and the brightness. And the both, brightness, both. those are both factors. You multiply so, them together and you get the amount. It's the amount of blue light you receive that is the key. So it's um right. So I also just am noticing that the science on this was clear by 2007 and the iPhone came out around 2010. And it seems to me that the intensity of the light and the brightness coming out of a phone on factory settings is exactly what you're telling us to avoid. And yet these manufacturers created these devices that we sit and have them in front of our faces like this very commonly, especially, even, especially with children all night long. <laughs> That's right. And and they do that because it's all about appearances. We like pretty things. We like crisp white screens, you know, all those things. And the thing is, we humans cannot see the amount of blue that's coming out of the computer screen in front of you or, or, or your phone. You can't. You just It looks white. You know, who knew it was blue coming out? 
but but in fact, and you've got to go and use um, a device called a spectrophotometer, and you know with that spectrophotometer you can then see um, exactly what the um, what the blue content is, and so you know I can just take um, a snapshot of the screen as I'm watching you now, right? And I just point it. It's a size. By the way, it's the same size as my cell phone, basically, right? Just in terms of size. Take a snapshot of it, and lo and behold, you know we can see, you know, all the. Now I've got daylight here. I'm going to do it a little closer, and you can see the blue that's in the, coming out of the screen. Yeah. Big spike. Yeah, there's a big spike, out. big blue right. spike right there. Yeah. Right. Anyway, but that's that's actually what you need. That tells you what is in any space, any color, and everything else. Um, and that's a, really a key device, um, but few people have them in reality. Yes. Right. Okay, so I just want to recap a little bit. So you started uh, your research into circadian medicine. Um, the luminaries of the time said, oh, don't bother with that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, right. it's, it's, it's not very interesting. It doesn't really matter. There's nothing yeah. much there. Yeah. And then you and your colleagues went on to discover that, in fact, we have the SCN, which is shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are programmed by light as humans. And this completely transformed our understanding of circadian biology and how it affects human health. That's right. Yeah. It's, okay. Yeah. All right. And so then and then the melatonin piece became added in. So I just want to do like a, a little bit of a deep dive into sort of three key areas that you mentioned. And if you could explain um, the mechanism of by which dysfunctional circadian rhythms are causing harm in the areas of cancer, fatigue and obesity. So let's start with obesity. Um because I, I one of the things that shocks people the most is when somebody says, "Oh, well, look, you know, blue light after sunset is actually spiking your insulin," and people are like, "What?" <laughs> I don't what you like. I have to eat candy for that to happen. It's like no, not necessarily. So explain what's going on there, please. Well, blue light does a number of things. I mean, remember, you, you are you should never be seeing blue light at night. You would not in nature, right? But yeah. when we expose the blue light, it does a couple of things. Number one, it interferes with our glucose metabolism. We have what, what we developed, something called insulin resistance. In other words, the body does not respond to insulin, and hence insulin has to be pumped out more. And this is an effect you can get immediately the first night you expose to blue light. It, it happens right away. This is not something, it's not like a cancer which has to take years to develop. This is something immediate. The second interesting thing that happens. And it's very notable, and particularly people working at night, is that it stimulates appetite. You get ravenously hungry under blue mm. light. And so if you look at people under blue light, and we've had a chance to look at people under blue light and then under light where the blue's removed, right? Same people. And you find they eat twice as many snacks, you know, when the snacks are available uh, mm. during the night shift under blue light than they do. Um, under light that where there's depleted blue. So, you know, wow. so there's two things going on. It's the snacking going on, leads to weight gain. We also got this insulin metabolism, glucose metabolism disruption. And you you can actually render someone, a perfectly healthy person, uh, render them pre-diabetic by the end of the first night shift. Um, wow. Just exposure to blue rich light at night. Yeah. Could you, could you repeat what is happening, how the blue light is doing that to our bodies. Okay. Well, take take it through all the, all the, the whole process, right? What is happening is that um, blue is um, being detected by special cells in the eye called um, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. They're called IPRGCs. Mm -hmm. Those okay. are the blue detectors that are in the eye. And they're particularly, by the way, in the lower part of the eye down here, in the eyeball down the bottom there, which means they're more sensitive to light from the sky or, or light from the ceiling. Okay. That triggers a pathway that goes directly 
to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and the SCN is the biological, the major master pacemaker, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. By the way, yeah. my favorite typo done by someone who was typing this said the supercharismatic nucleus. Oh, <laughs> so good, I love it. <laughs> I have to but, say, I still avoid saying that word because I can never super, remember where the bit, goes. Once I said that, people coming yeah. out of their head. So it is the suprachiasmatic, which means it's above yeah. the optic nerves, the optic chiasm, right? Yeah. That in turn triggers a number of responses, but the pathways go into the pineal gland, um, and the pineal is where the most of the melatonin is produced, and so that signal goes through the body, and melatonin is protective. It is involved in glucose metabolism. It's involved in cancer suppression. It's involved in many many health things. So that 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 normal. And by the way, um, there's a we ought to clear up some of the. There's a huge amount of misinformation out there. Um, melatonin is not the sleep hormone, right? Too many people, even so-called experts, say that. Mel if you give someone melatonin during the day, it doesn't make them sleepy, right? Melatonin, unless it's in huge doses, way more than the physiological dose. Melatonin is the darkness signal hormone. It what tells its role is to tell all the cells in the body, hey, it's dark outside. That's what it does. And then it does all the metabolic repair and other processes that go on during the night it gets them all going and that's critical to our health is of course sleep is one of the things that goes on during that time but it's not it's not causing sleep per se right right so okay. um the, the, just clear that one up. yes um the so uh, sorry just to go ahead, just to Steve. clarify so the suppression of that melatonin then leads to extremely poor quality sleep because the body is not doing what it's meant to be doing when it's asleep because right. it hasn't got the signal from the melatonin. Is that yeah? Well, it's not fair. It's, yeah, no, it, it's it's disrupting many body processes, not just sleep. It's disrupt. What it's doing is, um, it's disrupting the repair of cells. It's disrupting the, the glu how we metabolize and cope with glucose. It's affecting insulin resistance. That problem we mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, it's affecting. Um, uh, the suppression of cancer cells, melatonin normally suppresses cancer cell growth, suppresses it. Uh, wow. Beautiful studies, by the way, demonstrating that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just if I take a quick aside there, if I there are rat models, we can have a rat, and you can and put in the rat human breast cancer and have the breast cancer growing on the rat, okay, uh, as a model. Mm -hmm. Those rats exposed to blue light at night. Well, the, the cancers grow rapidly. Those lights, you know, and if they're exposed to lights without blue, the cancer doesn't grow nearly as fast. If wow. you now go and take now a beautiful experiment uh, done up in Thomas Jefferson University um, and then Tulane, they took a group of night nurses or night night workers mm -hmm. and, and and women, and they took one set they one night they had them all in the dark, another night they had them in bright light. In the dark, melatonin rises, reaches a peak about two o'clock in the morning, and they took samples of their blood. Mm -hmm. And the next night, they had them under bright light, and there's no melatonin comes out. The melatonin is totally suppressed. And they took another sample of the blood. Mm -hmm. And they shipped these two blood samples, melatonin rich, mm -hmm. melatonin weak, or poor, shipped them down to lane, infused them into the rats, and lo and behold, the, whip, the blood from the women who were in the dark, high in melatonin, Suppress the tumors. The blood from the women that were in the light with low melatonin, the tumors grew rapidly. So it's a beautiful illustration of the wow. melatonin signal, right? Beautiful. Amazing. Done by David Blask and his colleagues at Tulane and the, and the team at Thomas Jefferson. And what was the approximate time frame of this experiment? It was done in about 2006 time frame, something like that, 2005, 2006. But it's a classic, absolute classic. Yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing to me that that wasn't front page news. Yeah. Well, as I say, this has not, this whole subject is, it's still amazing to me that we have invented um, LED light. We have blue rich fluorescence, and now we have even more potent LED lights. And most of them are blue rich, and we're sticking them everywhere. And people love bright lights, so they crank up the light, which means you get. Mm -hmm. More blue. Right. And okay. We, we got to stop it somehow. Yes. No, we do. And, you know, you 
I'm going to move on from from the obesity because uh, you've explained sort of how blue light at night causes increased eating in a pre-diabetic state. Uh, so let's, you know, now we've moved into the cancer and you open your book um, talking about your wife's friend who died of cancer, leaving three children and yes. her husband. Yeah. And as a woman in my 40s, uh, I have had a front row seat to that exact situation both people close to me and friends of friends and it's it's insane and so i'm just just trying to wrap my mind around the idea that there was a there has been definitive research showing um the dangers of art, bright artificial light at night especially to women who have the breast cancer gene um and yet None of us knew to think of that as a as a factor to consider. You know, these women, they were so conscious of what they ate. They were so conscious of their exercise. Like they were very, if they had known what to do, they would have done it, I guess is my point. And yet, you know, especially with the devices and the light bulbs, n- none of us had any idea. That's right. That's right. No, the data is quite staggering. It's the best analogy is um, smoking and lung cancer. We know that um, 80% of um, lung cancer cases are related to smoking, but 20% aren't. There are people who never smoked, including my brother, by the way, who unfortunately died recently of, of lung cancer, never smoked right. in his life. Wow. But, but there is a huge, you know, so there are cases anyway, but it's very analogous. If we look at the breast cancer rates have been climbing steadily between 1970 and 2010, about a 40 year period, when blue rich fluorescence came out, breast cancer in American women climbed fourfold, right? If you look at, and if you now, and, and how do we know that it's related to that? Well, there's several very, very clear clues. If you look at people before electric light was invented, breast cancer rates in women were very low. It was a rare cancer. It has gone and a a rate of about 20 per 100,000 women per year. Now in westernized countries, the well with fully electrified westernized countries, people living with all the light sources, it's over 100 uh, women with breast cancer out of 100,000. So that's a five-fold increase, right? That's one. So Two is we can look at the t- as the it ramping up as electrification. With some countries got electrified and still are some places in the world aren't electrified. Those those are very low breast cancer rates. And as country as countries r- gradually get electrified around the world, you can trace their breast cancer rates climbing as they do that. Three blind women or these women who've been blind, you know, from early age have very rare breast cancer. Right? Mm. Okay. I mean, it's it's staggering that when you start pulling it all together, and then we have this very direct evidence of the role of light and blue light in particular triggering these responses and and suppressing melatonin and the role of melatonin. So the science is really pretty robust, and it's a big effect. So it it's I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the majority of breast cancer cases today in the westernized world are related to um, light exposure, seeing the wrong light at the wrong time. Which is huge, and yeah, you know, and and so and think about it. All the public health things you could do, you know, you, you get all these toxins in the environment and PFASs and all the other stuff, you know, that people worry about. Really hard to deal with. Yes, it's pretty simple. Just change the frigging light bulb. Yes, I mean it's it's not hard, right? I mean, yeah. it, it, it's about a public health thing you could do, but it's prevented by really problem one big problem in that we've become and i'm entirely sympathetic to obviously climate change and global warming and all the rest of it obviously mm-hmm. what it has to be but we, we have become obsessed with getting light with us um as efficient as possible and the problem yeah. is it's that blue rich light is the most efficient light so yeah. and we what we do is by the way we measure light as lumens per watt Lumens is a measure of light, and watt is, of course, a measure of electricity. So the incandescent light bulb went out because it can only produce 15 lumens per watt, 
of electricity. Mm -hmm. The LEDs are producing 100 or more lumens per watt. So you can see why people want to change to those. The problem is we've got an artificial, and, the, and now they want to raise those standards higher and higher. The problem is that a lumen is actually not a measure of total light. It's only a measure of the green and yellow part of light that's associated with brightness. So it's a measure of the brightness of light. It does not measure at all the blue content. It does not measure at all the red content. Red light is highly associated. My chapter coming out this week, by the way, we'll be talking about the healing power of red light, where all the healing parts of all the different parts of the spectrum. Sunlight is full of multiple healing parts of the spectrum. Violet does certain things. Blue does certain things. Green does certain things. Red does certain things. But this lumen per watt problem is we've got a metric that the engineers have latched onto and the politicians have latched onto. And we are forcing ourselves to have a very harsh blue rich light just to meet an energy standard. So we are precipitating a worse problem, um, that a more immediate problem, quite frankly. And yet you can engineer light. You can engineer light to be efficient um, if you give a little more leeway that's also healthy. So right. we've got to strike a balance here. We've gone way, yes. the pendulum swung way too far towards this energy rich blue rich light. Um, and um, yeah, and, and, and yeah. we're going to make a change. So the metric that we're using um, with our lighting systems are based in, entirely on um, inputs that have nothing to do with human health. That's right. Yeah, it's bright. It's a measure of brightness of light. It's not the measure of the healthiness of light. Okay, and and yeah. and then, and that's just the light bulbs. We aren't even talking about the screens from phones and laptops. Yeah, well, that's true. And all of this, by the way, the same thing as you can do. And one of the things, uh, you know, we haven't got to that yet. But one of the things I did was then say, well, let's. How do we fix this problem? So we invented LED chips that actually could deliver the right spectrum of light. You know, remove the blue at night. But you can do it in. Now in computer screens too, so yeah. we got we got screens that produce no blue at night. We've got light bulbs that produce no light, no um, blue at night. So my bedroom is lit by light bulbs that don't have any blue in them. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so is ours. And our neighbors drive by and they're like, "What? <laughs> what? What is that glow?" <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't have to be. It does not have to be yellow orange. You can do it with yellow yeah. orange because that's obviously you're taking all the blue. You can mm -hmm. actually engineer light that's much closer to the regular white light. Um, okay, by so balancing it out. All right. So your version is doesn't make it look like a I'm uh, developing film in a in a photo lab. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You don't have to look like a photo lab or a, <laughs> um, or a semiconductor chip factory. Right. right. <laughs> Um, all right. So we talked about uh, obesity. We talked about cancer. Um, what are what are the sort of leftover health implications um, of messing up our circadian rhythms that we haven't touched on yet? Well, hypertension and heart disease also. Um, so I mean, one classic study, by the way, uh, recently published out of the University of Chicago is they studied people who were elderly living at home in Chicago, and these are people in their 70s and 80s, and they, um, and they found over 50% of them slept with the lights on at night. And the ones that, and this is an extraordinary number, by the way, I, I mean, this, this is 30-40% um, of all adults sleep with the lights on at night, which is staggering. Some are lighting in the bedroom. They do it because of anxiety and all sorts of other reasons. Huh. Um, but when you do that, those people who were sleeping the lights on had double the rate of diabetes, double the rate of obesity, and double the rate of hypertension, high blood pressure. Um, wow. So that's looking at a very comparable population. So yeah, no, that is one of the things that um, uh, hypertension is certainly part of the mix here. And a whole host of other conditions have been linked to, um, uh, you know, to circadian disruptions, a very, very broad range of disorders. Um, right. Our immune system is really impacted. Your um, uh, your ability to fight off um, um, COVID is affected. I mean, all sorts of things are affected by, yeah. um, you know, your, whether you're, you've got a robust circadian system or whether it's been disrupted by light. So it seems over the course of your career, it's the it's gone from oh don't bother studying 
circadian biology, it doesn't really matter, to, oh, actually circadian biology is probably the most important factor in our health that's under our control. I believe it is, and I think the evidence is there, yeah. Wow. Um, it's incredible. I was I went to see uh, the Oppenheimer movie recently. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a scene where the, a very young Oppenheimer's in Germany and um, Heiselberg says, oh, don't go back to America. Nobody there is... Nobody there thinks theoretical physics is worth anything. Stay in Germany where we understand. And Oppenheimer says, no, that's why I'm going back. <laughs> that's why I'm going. I'm going to be the one. <laughs> oh, no, and, it's a great, I mean, believe me, yeah. in science, you want to be uh -huh. early on in something brand new. I mean, that's where all the fun happens, right? Yeah. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. But also to your point, it does take, it takes a strength of will to go against people who really feel they know what they're talking about when they tell you, no, don't bother. That's yeah. wrong. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And everything that turns out to be true is considered crazy at one point, it seems. Well, it's like Howard Schultz's uh, father-in-law who told him, well, you know, selling expensive coffee, that's got no future to it. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I think we have a hand up, hand up from Daniel White. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Daniel is the founder of the Sleep Better, Live Better Foundation, and he's out of the UK and has started an amazing program where he's um, helping to educate the school system in his area about the importance of circadian rhythm and getting getting sleep in darkness. So Daniel, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much, Meredith, and thank you for that awesome talk. Um, I really, really, really enjoyed it, uh, Martin. Yeah, well, Daniel, I've been hearing about, uh, thank you for sharing your work. I'm excited to see what you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, I know that we've been in touch briefly through LinkedIn at, uh, at some point over the last month or so. Um, my question, I guess, um, I might already know a few of the answers to, but I thought it would be an interesting one to bring up is, you know, the implications of this uh, non-natural light environment for like growth and development in children, adolescents, teenagers, um, because from my limited understanding is a lot of things that are happening to children, um, you know, not just in the sphere of, of mental health, but in terms of, you know, maturation and growth and things like that of systems that has been sped up a lot since things have gotten brighter and brighter. And obviously, you know, the, the key principles um, and the kind of objectives of the work that we're doing is around education, uh, particularly around light exposure and circadian rhythms. Obviously, there are more factors that go into it than that. Um, but I just wondered your your take on it and if you had anything to share or would kind of explore that area. And is there is there a chapter in the book coming up on it? Because I, I haven't read oh, that no, one no, yet. No, I cover, <laughs> cover a few. <laughs> you know, I, I've got to summarize, you know, and, and I should say this, I'm publishing this book, as I'm sure the audience knows, on, on Substack, which is a way now of sharing it. You know, we publish a new chapter every two weeks. And there's one coming out this Thursday, for example. And... Um, so it's uh, at lightdrmartinmorey.substack.com. Um, but that book is, I think it's going to be, it might end up being an endless book, you know, because there's always new topics to cover. On that topic, a uh, big effect is um, people didn't reach, women, girls did not reach um, puberty, their, their first period, until they were 17 or 18, back in pre-Thomas Edison days. Now it's 13 or 14. Right, it has a huge impact. Seasonal um, births used to be seasonal; they no longer are seasonal. Right, all sorts of things. We're affected by the seasonal rhythms as well. So, and and the much more general area is yes, no, absolutely, just general health is is hugely affected by bright light, sunshine, all the rest of it. Um, you know, getting exposed, getting out every day. We preach that it's really critical to get a light diet. Is one thing to think about. Um, in other words, you got you want blue rich light in the mornings, particularly in the first part of the morning. Uh, you want to, you know, the, and so forth. What you need all the way across the day. What you and then when you need to change the the quality of the light and the amount of light is your light is your light diet. It's as critical as any um, nutritional diet. And one of the crazy things I found when I went on to one of the big websites of Penguin. Um, books, um, Penguin Random House, probably the largest publisher. Um, 1,881 books have been published on nutrition diets, on food diets, right? 1,881. And one in their whole catalog published on light and health back in 2013 before LEDs were invented or were in the market. You know, it's crazy. So people are stuck on 
uh, trends, and we've got to change some of that stuff. But yes, but no, there is a whole lot of maturational things, and I think we're only just beginning to learn some of that stuff. Um, and certainly people's alertness, their ability to sleep, uh, the work you've done and able to get kids get better sleep by um, by controlling their blue exposure in the evening, I think is absolutely critical as part of the solution. Um, yeah, we've got to, got to com- combat that and get much smarter. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I'm in a, a locked into a few debates at the minute with a few people, some of them you, who you, you may know, um, around like the the differences or the the kind of weight of evidence or the necessity of um, like public health changes around education when it comes to circadian rhythms and particularly light exposure versus, for example, uh, changes to school start times. Um, and we know that, you know, from research that, you know, um, I'm not like, I'm not too heavily fixated upon like chronotype research myself personally. I, I kind of, you know, I have this intuitive feeling that there's something about, you know, changing seasons and changing light environments and things like that, that tends to dictate more of that stuff. Um, but I had some interesting conversations with somebody who's looking at pioneering some research in the channel islands where I'm also doing my research, but on another Island who's looking at, um, changes to school start times. And, and we know obviously that in the U S you know, schools are starting far too early in some States, you know, 6 7 AM and, and it's ridiculous. And there are all these, um, you know, evidence-based, uh, observations of, you know, um, the delay of circadian phase timing in, in adolescence and things like that. But I, you know, have a very strong point of contention for this group which i'm a part of um looking at their kind of plans for their research which is that if you provide you know no education about the impacts of light exposure and circadian health on sleep um, and well-being but you just change school start times you know you're going to get a very mixed bunch of results you're going to get kids who stay awake even later playing games and staring into artificial lights who stay in bed even longer in the mornings and get even less natural light in the mornings and all right. these sorts of things so i'm kind of um in this interesting position i wanted your your view on that stuff well, I think you've got, to, you've got to deal with both because I think the um, yeah. we're highly sensitive to time zone changes. I mean, one of the most remarkable things I'll be talking about in the book, um, you know, as I looked at this whole issue of um, daylight saving time and all the rest of it, that whole argument. Um, if you look as you go across a time zone, you've got a huge difference, about an hour or more's difference in when the sunrise occurs, right? As you go across the time zone. If you look at people who live just west of a new time zone and people who live 20 miles away but they're at the other end of their other time zone in other words their 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 the health profiles is staggeringly different the people who are who who are disrupted by the daylight savings time um are, it's huge a huge difference the rates of diabetes cancer everything else just going 20 miles and this goes across every time zone Vertically throughout the United States, we have, of course, several of these boundaries, healthy on one side, you know, and unhealthy on the other side of that same time zone, just showing you small amounts of light effects, uh, timing of light effects uh, on public health in a, in a large, large population. Yeah, I, th- I think it's really interesting. I mean, one of the things I, th- I think I feel most strongly about as a result of having a lot of challenges with my light environment when I was young is that um, a lot of the policy makers these days, particularly where I'm from, you know, in the schooling system, um, they are perhaps in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And so they're so far disconnected from this emerging research that it makes a lot of sense for them to look at, you know, science over the last two or three decades, such as school start time changes and, you know, these other things that have impacted sleep. But I'm really here. They're like, no, this is the like smoking gun here. This is the thing that we need to, to really also be looking at you know in in collaboration with those other ideas but thanks for sharing that and that brings up you know daniel your question too about the development of young people um martin i'm wondering about your your thoughts on the mental health aspects of this because um as we're seeing epidemics of breast and prostate cancer in adults we're seeing epidemics of anxiety disorders uh in children and starting very young I, you know, just in casual conversation with people that I know, I'm hearing of, you know, 11 year olds who are in inpatient psych wards for anxiety disorders, um, which just, you know, seems incredible. These are, you know, these are families that are not in a state of trauma or living in a war zone. You know, these are just fairly typical American families who are experiencing this. Yeah, it's it's a vital part of it. I mean, I just tell you one little anecdote. Again, I'm going to talk a lot more about it in the book later. Um, 
interesting, fascinating studies of a psychiatric hospital with two sets of rooms. One is the windows are facing south and east, okay? The other is north and west, right? The admissions, you know, they they get better twice as fast in the ones with the morning light, wow. facing south and east. In other words, their hospital stays a half the length. The same population, you put people in, you know, the hospital, and the ones that get this natural light in the mornings are out wow. of there, you know, with their, their with depressive and anxiety disorders are out of there in half the time. I mean, it's staggering stuff. And so wow. you know, there is, and, and you know, what we do is, you know, even put them in people in hospitals. Now we give them blue rich light, and we give them all sorts of things in their hospitals, and we probably don't expose them to much daylight. You know, it's uh, we just we're just messing badly with Mother Nature. Uh, and 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 as I say, there's enough stress in the world and everything else that circadian disruption is is just uh, exacerbates the risk in so many things. And it's very much the circadian system is very much linked to psychiatric state um, and disruption of circadian rhythms to psychiatric disorders. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a, that's a big big health issue. Yeah, if you don't mind me sharing, I thought that, you know, I think this is one of the things when we're approaching looking at uh, the research with the schools. Obviously, I have a back history and a story around, you know, my own personal experience, but like being 30,000 feet in the air, you know, one of, to you and I and Meredith and everybody else here and many other emerging people now, one of the simplest changes that we can make, the, you know, the the low hanging fruit, if you like, the highest return on investment, the largest, you know, leverage behavior is just changing lighting. You know, mm -hmm. we're looking at all of these other ways to solve mental health crises and, you know, economic problems and health crises all over the world. And it's kind of like, you know, we're missing the the most obvious thing. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. Yeah, and that really is. It's, you know, as you were saying, Martin, it is so simple. And I think sometimes maybe that's why it is overlooked, the simplicity of it. People want a complex solution to complex problems, but that's back to nature is really the bottom line. Yeah. Um, all right, so Vanessa has a question in the chat. She's got to hop off, but... Um, she wondered about the impact of lighting on the birthing environment and newborn babies. Um, there is a significant effect of uh, light at night in terms of um, uh, the length of labor and other things. And so there is some research on that area. I'll be covering that a little bit later. Um, but certainly um, that is uh, what lights you're exposed to has a big impact on the uh, uh, the length of labor and uh, and you know delivery delivery room, so that's one part of it. Um, the child's um, early newborn and able to get themselves synchronized to light and dark, as you know, the babies are born uh, without their clock being linked to their sleep. You know, in other words, they mm -hmm. they'll nap around the clock, and then they 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 establish the neural connections between the eyes and the clock. And their sleep and their sleep apparatus, you know, over over months, that can obviously is determined by how rigorously, you know, are you getting exposed to light. Um, I always like to say one of the things coming. I'm British by background, and I came over to America, and one of the first no, things I noticed is children never get outside, and babies don't get outside if it's raining. You know, British babies <laughs> are waterproof; <laughs> they, go, they go out and whatever the weather, you know. And, uh, so uh, you know it's it's a staggering, right? So just keep indoors in this twilight, as opposed to being expressed to a robust day-night cycle. Um, and so, yeah. So anyway, um, so it's uh, yeah, sunlight is. Um, Florence Nightingale knew sunlight was curative in so many ways, and the patients who were exposed to sunlight got better much faster than those that didn't. So yeah. Yes. And there's could be a whole other conversation of how we've demonized the sun. <laughs> we'll do a, we'll do part two on that. <laughs> um, unless there are any other questions, I'm going to wrap this up. Martin, thank you so much. Um, the name of the book is The Light Doctor. You can enter the if you put the light doctor into your little search bar on Substack, it will pop right up. Um, or you can go to the lightdoctor.com set. That's Any right. other ways you would like people to find you? 
Uh, well, you can find me LinkedIn wherever, but basically, yeah, that would be the way. And uh, you know, encourage to spread the word because it's it's the book. I think people are finding very readable. It's just great yeah. question of getting it out there and getting the message and getting the broad education we need, and then um, and then that will lead to advocacy. And there's a whole area about what do we do about this, right? And how yes. do we how do we how do we move the needle here? Um, yes. But clearly, uh, the needs to people start to be need to be concerned about their own spaces where they live, right? And what do you do in your own home? But also, what about the spaces I don't control, like my workplace, um, you know, other places? Yeah. Um, you know, how do I how do I affect change there? And so that's a whole conversation too. Yes. Well, you know, I'd love to do another podcast, and we can we can get into those areas because that. That this absolutely needs to happen. And I will say that this book is perfect. We spent a lot of time in our community talking about how to communicate this and finding resources to give to people because when they just hear it from, from one person, they're kind of like, what? What? Okay. <laughs> so to have a book that is so well researched and from such an authority in the field written in a way that's meant for, you know, a non-science person to be able to digest and wrap their minds around, it's a much, much needed uh, resource and gift. So again, thanks for doing it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks for being here, everyone. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.